Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you back to the End Time Seminar. This is session five of eight. And again, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, um, all the sessions do build upon one another, so it'd be helpful to watch the previous sessions before this one. In session one, we did an introduction to the end times. We took a jet tour through the book of Revelation, and we looked at three views of the millennium. In session two, we talked about the importance of the book of Daniel. Very important to understand Daniel to understand the end times. In session three, we took a look at four views of the rapture. And then in our last session, session four, we looked at the day of the Lord. And uh, I do have a few folks I'd like to thank uh, before we get started tonight. I'd like to thank Ted Larson again for his amazing images from both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. I'd like to thank Pat Smith for her wonderful images from the book of Revelation. I'd like to thank Duncan Long and Peter Olson and Nicholas Pena and the many talent artists at Good Salt. And I'd also like to thank Albert Sharpie. Albert has uh, some wonderful end times charts in his book that he's allowed me to use, and so I'm very thankful for that. All right, again, we're approaching this study from the premillennial view. And from the premillennial view, you and I are living right here at the present time. We're living in what's known as the church age. And so the seven-year period that we learn about in the book of Daniel, that's still future. That time period hasn't happened yet. And of course, after that, we have the thousand years where Jesus will be on planet Earth as he rules and reigns during the millennium. And then from there, we're going to go into eternity where we're going to live with the Lord forever. And what I'd like us to do tonight is I'd like to try to lay out a chronology of events that the Bible indicates will unfold during that seven-year period. So we'll start with that chronology tonight, and then we'll add some more things to that as we go into future sessions. And the only way we can do that again is because God has spoken about the end times. Remember, here's a passage we looked at previously from Isaiah. God says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's no one like me. And God said, I can declare the end from the beginning, and I can tell you from ancient times the things which have not been done saying that my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So again, the only way that we can know anything about the future is because God himself has spoken about the future and he has declared some things to us. And again, in the first verse of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the Apostle John tells us that we're reading the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave him to show his bondservants, that's us, the things which must soon take place. So clearly, again, God really wants us to know these things. Now, that seven-year period, unfortunately, is going to be the worst in the history of this planet, especially the last three and a half years. And so you might be thinking, well, why do I say that? Well, for several reasons. Number one, this beast is coming our way, right? The Bible tells us that the Antichrist is coming. This dragon is also headed our way. And, of course, we learned that the dragon is Satan. So the Bible tells us that Satan himself is going to come here to planet Earth, and we're going to be looking at that. And we learn from John about the Antichrist that he, John says he was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And again, we learned about this in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had the, the dream about the four great beasts. And so John tells us that the future Antichrist is going to come out of the revised Roman Empire, which was the fourth beast. And John tells us that he's going to be like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. And there we, in Daniel 7, we had the leopard, the bear, and the lion. We had Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. And so John the Apostle is letting us know that when the Antichrist comes and he establishes his kingdom, it's going to be a composite of these previous beast kingdoms that we've had before. And we're told that the dragon gives the Antichrist his power and his throne and great authority. It's pretty staggering when you look at that verse right there. The Bible tells us that Satan himself is going to give power to the Antichrist. He's going to give him his throne and great authority. So we have the dragon, Satan, and we have the beast, the Antichrist, and they are headed our way. And we have another beast coming. John tells us that this beast is also coming. John tells us that he saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spoke like a dragon. Remember, he has two horns like a lamb. He appears to be like Jesus, but he speaks like a dragon who is the devil. And we're told that he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So this beast exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist. And we're told he's going to make the earth and those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. So this false prophet, this beast, is going to get the people on the earth to worship the Antichrist. Now, it's amazing that he's going to do that. And you wonder, why are people going to do that? Why would people worship the Antichrist? Well, we learn here that he had a fatal wound that was healed. Now, again, whether that's an actual fatal wound, whether he actually really dies and God allows Satan to resurrect him, or whether that's a fake resurrection, um, theologians dispute that. Um, I'll show you a verse in a few minutes that I think indicates to us more that it's probably a fake resurrection that it's just going to appear that he had a fatal wound and was, and was healed. So the false prophet is also coming our way. So this unholy trinity is coming in the future. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, they're all coming here. 
And they're all going to be here during that 70th week. All of them are going to be here. Now, the amazing thing is that the people of this world are going to embrace them. The people of this world are going to embrace this unholy trinity. Look at what John says here in Revelation 13, 3. He said, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound. So there's what I was telling you a minute ago. It appears that maybe he had a fatal wound. Whether he really did or not, we don't know. But it appears that he did. And we're told that the fatal wound had been healed. So the people of this world, whether that's a real resurrection or whether that's a fake resurrection, the people of this world are going to believe that he has risen from the dead. And so we're told that the whole world is going to be astonished and they will follow the beast. And you can understand maybe why from their perspective, why they're going to do that. They're going to think he rose from the dead. And we're told that they worship the dragon. Not only are they going to embrace him, we're told that they're actually going to worship him. That the people of this world will worship Satan because he gave his authority to the beast and they worship the beast as well. Saying who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him. So the amazing thing about this is not only is the world going to embrace them, we're told that the world is going to worship both of them. That's pretty staggering. The people of this world are going to embrace Satan, they're going to embrace the Antichrist, and they're going to worship both of them. We're told that it was given to the Antichrist the power to make war with the saints, that's Christians, believers, and he's going to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And we're told that all those who dwell on the earth will worship him. Wow. There's another verse that tells us that. Everyone's going to worship him. Now, the amazing thing is that they won't worship the true Christ, but they'll worship Antichrist. Amazing. And who's going to worship him? All who dwell on the face of the earth. Everyone. Everyone whose name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life. That's pretty amazing. Every time I read these verses, I'm just completely amazed by that, that the world is going to embrace them and worship them. And so we're told this about the false prophet. Um, He's going to come out of the earth. And again, he's going to exercise all the authority of the first beast. He's going to make those who dwell on the earth worship the first beast. So for those who don't volunteer to worship the Antichrist, he's going to make them worship the Antichrist. And again, we're told that his fatal wound was healed. And we're told that this beast, the false prophet, is going to perform great signs. He's even going to make fire come down from heaven in the presence of men. And he's going to deceive those who dwell on the earth because of the signs that was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. And he's going to tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast. And again, we're told he had the wound of the sword and he's come back to life. So the false prophet again is coming our way and he's going to cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast, they will be killed. So we're told that he's going to do this in addition. addition, He's going to cause all. He's going to cause everyone, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, that's everyone. He's going to cause them to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And we're told he's going to provide so that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there's going to be a one world economy and the Antichrist is going to control that. And if you do not take his mark on your right hand or your forehead, you will not be able to buy or sell. And so again, we're told he's going to cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this unholy trinity is coming in the future and they are headed our way. All right, now remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Jesus said, let the reader understand. Now remember, Jesus is talking about the Antichrist here. This is how Jesus describes him. He describes him as the abomination of desolation. And Jesus is letting us know there's going to be a future, there's going to be future believers who will be alive to see this. And Jesus says, when you see that, if you're alive to see that, if you're alive to see the Antichrist set himself in the temple, Jesus said, then you need to, Be careful because there's going to be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. Now think about that. That's a pretty staggering statement. Jesus said that when the Antichrist goes into the temple and sets himself up as God and declares himself to be God, Jesus said that's going to be the time period that has the greatest tribulation of any time period in the history of the world. And that's pretty staggering. Jesus is telling us that this is going to be the worst time that the planet has ever seen, right? And we've seen some pretty bad tribulation in our time. Think about Adolf Hitler and the fact that he killed six million Jews. And we know what happened in Auschwitz and some of the other death camps. And God tells us that that's nothing compared to what's coming in the future. So that alone is just really, really pretty staggering when you think about that. And we're hearing this from Jesus himself. So those seven years are going to be the worst in the history of this planet, especially the last three and a half years, right? But it's not all bad news. Daniel gives us some real good news when we go back to Daniel chapter 2. Remember what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar? 
He told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, in the days of those kings, what kings? In the days of these kings, in the days of that revised Roman Empire. Remember, the legs of iron represented the kingdom of Rome. And then we're told that the toes are made of clay and iron. And so the Roman Empire is going to be revised, and there's going to be a future kingdom here that the Antichrist is going to control. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that in the days of those kings, in the days when these kings are ruling on the earth, Daniel said the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. At the time when these rulers are ruling, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to set up God's kingdom, which will never be destroyed. It's not going to be left for any other people. God's kingdom is not going to be left for people to rule. We're told that it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but God's kingdom will itself endure forever. And God tells us how he's going to do that. Remember, there's going to be a stone. It's going to be a stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands, and the stone is going to crush the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And Daniel said, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. And he said, so the dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. And remember, that stone is Jesus. We learned in that session two that that stone who's going to destroy all these earthly kingdoms is Jesus. Remember what the Apostle Paul said? Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if you believe in Jesus, you will not be disappointed. Now, Daniel also gave us some good news in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel said he kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there was one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days. The son of man is a title of deity. That's describing Jesus. And Jesus comes up to the Ancient of Days. That's God the Father. And Jesus was presented before the Father. And we're told that to him, to Jesus, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Wow, that is just wonderful news for us, isn't it? that when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom, his kingdom will never be destroyed. All right. So those seven years are going to be the worst in the history of this planet, especially the last three and a half years. But these thousand years are going to be the best in the history of this planet because Jesus will be here and he will literally be ruling and reigning in his millennial kingdom. And then from there, we're going to go into the new heaven and the new earth where we're going to live with Christ for all eternity. And that is certainly some very, very good news. God also tells us this. God tells us that in the future, when we're living with him in the new heaven and the new earth, that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That, to me, is one of the most staggering verses in the Bible. Every one of us has had pain in our life. Every one of us has had grief and hurt and pain. And we're told that God himself will wipe away every one of our tears. And look at this, and God tells us there will no longer be any death. You know, our biggest enemy is death. And God tells us there's coming a time there will be no more death. And he tells us there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. See, I don't think we can fully comprehend that. What is life going to be like in a place where there's no death, there's no mourning, there's no crying, there's no pain? That's where you and I are going to live for all eternity. Because God says, behold, he's making all things new. So certainly as bad as things are going to get, and they're certainly going to get really, really bad, this is where it all ends. The end result is that you and I are going to live with God forever in the new heaven and the new earth. And not just for a few hundred years or a few thousand years or even a few billion years. We're going to live with God forever and ever and ever and ever in new glorified resurrected bodies just like Jesus. So as Christians, as believers, we have a lot to look forward to. We just have so much to look forward to. All right, now last week we were trying to find out the answer to this question. And I'm going to review quite a bit from last week because there was a lot of material there. And I know that's hard to absorb in one session. So I'm going to review a lot of what I covered in the last session. I'm going to add some new things onto the back of that, okay? So we were trying to see if we could identify this two part, the answer to this two-part question. Can we identify the period of God's wrath and its starting point? And so the first part of the question was, can we identify the period of God's wrath? And for that answer, we searched the Old Testament. We went to the Old Testament, and we said that the answer to the first part of this question is yes, Right? The time period that God has described as his wrath is called the day of the Lord. And many of the Old Testament prophets spoke about this. Um, Zephaniah said this. Uh, God said this through the prophet Zephaniah. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. The Bible tells us that there's a period of time when God is going to come back and judge this planet. He's going to judge sinners and he tells us that it's called the day of the Lord. And these are pretty strong words from God. God says he's going to bring distress on men so they're going to walk like the blind. And he tells us why, because they've sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. That's not real popular today when you tell people that. <laughs> Neither their silver or their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath, right? I mean, we live in a world that they don't want to hear this. And if you, when you and I share this, they think we're crazy. 
But God himself says, this is what's coming. And God said the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, for God's going to make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. And of course, in the context here, God's talking about sinners. The reality is that God is going to come back and judge this planet, and he's going to judge the sinners on this planet, and God tells us he's going to make a terrifying end of every single sinner. And when you think about that, God has to do that, because he tells us that we're going to live in a new heaven and a new earth, which is the home of righteousness, and the new heaven and the new earth could not be the home of righteousness if sinners are living there. And so God is going to remove every sinner from the face of this planet. It's a terrifying time, but it is going to happen. And so now the second question was then, can we identify when that's going to happen? Can we identify the starting point? Well, I shared with you last session that the good news is that God tells us that the starting point of his wrath is not a mystery. It's not a mystery. The starting point of the day of the Lord is not a mystery. And here's why. Because God is so good that God said he was going to give us a sign before he does that. And when God gives us a sign, God's going to give us a universal sign. God's going to give us a supernatural sign so that everybody on this planet will know that this is a sign from God. And here's what God said he's going to do. The heavens are going to tremble. The sun and the moon are going to grow dark and the stars are going to lose their brightness. God is going to turn the sun, moon, and stars all dark at the same time. Again, as I shared with you last week, this will not be a solar eclipse. This will not be a lunar eclipse. Those are natural events. God allows those to happen naturally. This will be a supernatural act of God where God's going to turn off the lights. And here's what's even more amazing. God tells us, that he's going to do this before the day of the Lord starts. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So God is so good that God is going to give us a universal sign that every single person on this planet will know. And God's going to do that before the day of the Lord. God is going to turn off the lights and the universe will go dark. And the Bible tells us that out of that darkness, Jesus is going to break through in all his glory. Jesus is going to come back in power and great glory. And we're going to look at those verses again in just a few minutes. One chapter later, Joel tells us the same thing. He said, multitude, multitudes in the valley, valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will lose their brightness. And God tells us the same thing through the prophet Isaiah. He said, behold, the day of the Lord is coming. It's a cruel day. It's a day of God's burning anger. And God's going to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate the sinners from it. It's the same thing that Zephaniah told us, right? That the day of the Lord is going to be a time when God is going to remove all the sinners. And now Isaiah tells us the same thing about the lights. Look at what Isaiah says here. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Again, God is going to turn off the lights of the universe. So what did we learn about the day of the Lord? Well, we learned that it's a day of wrath like never before or ever again. It's the last call to return to the Lord. But God tells us it's a day of deliverance for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. For those of us that are Christians who put our faith in Jesus Christ, we will not face God's wrath. We will not experience the day of the Lord, right? As Christians, when Jesus comes, he will rapture us and we won't face this. And God is so good that he tells us he's going to give us a sign before this happens. And the sign of the day of the Lord is that the sun and the stars are going to be darkened and the moon is going to be darkened and turned to blood. So again, the starting point of the day of the Lord is not a mystery. God said he would give us a sign before the day of the Lord, and he's going to give us a sign so clear that we cannot miss it. The sign of the day of the Lord is that the sun, moon, and stars will all go dark at the same time. God is making this really clear for us to understand. The lights are going to go out. Now, I want you to think about this when it comes to the rapture views again. Many Christians believe in what's called the pre-trib rapture. And the Christians who believe in this view, they believe that God's wrath is poured out for the whole entire seven-year period. Matter of fact, they sometimes will call that whole seven-year period the tribulation period, right? Or they will call it the day of the Lord. They will use all three of those terms interchangeably. Now, the Christians who hold to this rapture view, they believe that the time period we just discussed, the day of the Lord, they believe it starts right here at the beginning of that seven-year period. Now, again, as we discussed last week, if that's true, if it's true that the day of the Lord starts right there, then we should see the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here because that's the sign that God said he would give us before the day of the Lord. So if the day of the Lord starts here, and this view is true, we should see the sun, moon, and stars going dark right there, right? Now, here's an example of a pre-trib book that teaches that. This is from Ron Rhodes. And again, I have great respect for Dr. Ron Rhodes. I have all of his books, learned many things from him. But I want you to notice what he says in his book here. He says, most prophecy experts believe that the day of the Lord is properly placed after the rapture in conjunction with the beginning of the tribulation period. So in other words, he says the day of the Lord is here. 
And again, I want to go slowly through this so you, you can see that I'm not putting any words in his mouth. He said, most prophecy experts, he's talking about Christians who believe in this view. He said, they believe the day of the Lord is placed after the rapture, right here, after the rapture, in conjunction with the beginning of the tribulation period. Okay, now that's true. If what he's saying here is true, then we should see the sun, moon, and stars going dark right there because that's the sign of the day of the Lord, right? Okay, now here's another book he wrote called The End Times in Chronological Order. And he says this. He said, the Antichrist signing of the covenant with Israel, that peace treaty, he said that constitutes not only the beginning of the tribulation period, but also the beginning of the day of the Lord. So he said that when the Antichrist makes that peace treaty with Israel, that that starts not only the tribulation period, but also the beginning of the day of the Lord. So again, he's placing the day of the Lord right here at the beginning of that seven-year period. Now, again, if this view is true, then we should see the sun, moon, and stars going dark over here, right? So far, so good? Okay. Now, there are other Christians who believe in what's called the pre-wrath rapture. They believe the rapture will happen somewhere in the second half of the 70th week. I mean, it could happen a little bit earlier. It could happen back here. We don't know the exact time because Jesus said you can't know the day or the hour. But basically, the belief here is that the rapture will happen at this point because God's wrath, the day of the Lord, is only some portion of the second half of the 70th week and then on into the 30 days. Now, here's a book written by Alan Kirshner called um, Pre-Wrath, A Very Short Introduction. And again, his premise in this book, and if you read other books or other articles about the pre-wrath view, the belief is that the day of the Lord starts over here. Well, again, if that's true, then we should see the sun, moon, and stars going dark over here, right? So that leads us to this. We know for sure that both of these views can't be true. I mean, if the sun, moon, and stars goes dark over here and the day of the Lord lasts the whole seven years, then I guess this view would be true. But if the Bible teaches us that the sun, moon, and stars doesn't go dark over, until over here, then this view is probably true. So the logical question is this. Where in the scriptures do we see that the sun, moon, and stars go dark? That's the question. And so for this answer last week, we searched the New Testament. We went to the New Testament to see if we could answer this question. Can we identify the starting point? And we knew what to look for. We were looking for the sign of the day of the Lord, right? We were looking for the sun, moon, and stars going dark. And so what we did is we went to the New Testament, and we said, can we find this? Now, I put a couple of Old Testament passages here to remind us of what we're looking for. We're looking for the sun, moon, and stars all going dark at the same time. And last session, you'll remember that we said, well, let's start with Jesus. If we could go to the New Testament and ask anybody to help us out on this, how about if we start with Jesus? And so we asked the question, did Jesus talk about the day of the Lord? And again, I meant, did Jesus talk specifically and clearly about the day of the Lord? I don't mean some vague reference where people could, you know, interpret it a dozen different ways. But is there anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus spoke specifically about the sun, moon, and stars going dark? And the answer to that question is yes, he did. It's right here in Matthew 24, 29. And Jesus said this, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. Wow. Jesus is using the exact same language to describe the day of the Lord, the sun, moon, and stars will go dark. But not only did Jesus tell us about that, look what Jesus did. He told us where it will happen. Jesus said it's going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Well, we all know what immediately means. It means like right afterwards, right? So the only question here is what days was Jesus talking about? Right? When Jesus said the sun, moon, and stars would go dark immediately after the tribulation of those days, the question is, well, then what days? Well, you'll remember that we said that we take a face value approach to understanding the scripture. So we said we're going to take scripture in context and we're going to let the scripture interpret the scripture. So in order to do that, we have to go back in context. Okay, so look where we're at right now. This is very important that you stay with me now. I don't want you to get lost here. Right now we're at Matthew 24, 29. <laughs> So in order to know what days Jesus is talking about, we have to back up a little bit to get the context. So all I'm going to do here now is I'm in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. I'm just going to back up a few verses till I get to Matthew 24, 15. Okay, everybody with me? All I did was just back up in the chapter so we can get the context. And Jesus said this. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Jesus said, when you see the Antichrist... And I told you about this through the prophet Daniel. When you see the Antichrist standing in the temple, Jesus said, then there will be great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world till now, nor ever will be. Well, let's go take a look at that passage that Jesus was talking about in Daniel, right? Because he said he told us through Daniel. So let's go to Daniel. It's right here. Daniel 9, 27. God tells us that he, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. 
That's that peace treaty. The Antichrist is going to confirm that peace treaty, which is going to start that seven-year period. And God tells us in the middle of that seven, in the middle of that week, he's going to commit the abomination of desolation. That's what Jesus was just talking about, right? And the Apostle Paul tells us what he's going to do. Paul said he, that the Antichrist is going to uh, oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. At the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to go into that temple. He's going to declare to the world that he is God. And Jesus said, when you see that, Jesus said there will be one generation of Christians. You'll see this. And Jesus says, when you see that, then there's going to be great tribulation. Okay, so now let's just take these verses and put them on a timeline. All right, let's go back to our timeline. So we know the Antichrist is going to sign that peace treaty with the nation of Israel. That's going to start the clock ticking on that final seven-year period. And we know that from Daniel that at the midpoint, Daniel just told us that in the middle of that week, he's going to break that covenant. And Daniel tells us he's going to commit the abomination of desolation. And Jesus says, when you see that, Jesus said, when you see that, that's when the great tribulation is going to start, right? Jesus said, then there will be great tribulation, unlike anything that's ever happened since the beginning of the world. Now, notice what Jesus said. Let me back up right here. This is Matthew 24, 21. I want you to notice what Jesus says in the very next verse. Jesus said, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, that starts the great tribulation. And Jesus said, if those days did not get cut short, no life would be saved. But Jesus said, for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. What Jesus is telling us here is that he's not going to let the great tribulation run the whole three and a half years. Because Jesus said, if he does, no one's going to survive. No Christians are going to survive. So Jesus said he's going to shorten those days. Now, again, he's not going to shorten the three and a half years. The three and a half years is etched in stone. That will not be shortened. What Jesus said he's going to do is he's going to cut these days short. Okay? So in other words, Jesus is not going to let this run the whole three and a half years. So he's going to cut that short. He tells us why. Because he said, if I don't do that, none of the elect will be, will be saved. In other words, the Christians are all going to get killed. The Antichrist is going to be killing Christians and Jews at this point. And Jesus said, if I don't cut those days short, none of you are going to survive. Okay, now stay with me now. This is really important. You've got to catch the timing here. I'm going to go back to the verse. Verse 29, look what Jesus said. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's when the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. So again, what days is Jesus referring to? Jesus is referring to these days right here. Okay, let that settle in. Jesus said, immediately, immediately after the tribulation of these days, that's when the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. So I want you to notice Jesus has the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here, not over here. Very important to understand. Now, the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. And what is that? Well, that's the sign of the day of the Lord. That's what Joel told us, right? The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So if Jesus has the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here, the day of the Lord would have to start over here. It can't start over here, right? Now, let's go through that sequence. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. Again, Jesus has the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here. All right, now, what is the universe going to look like at that time? Well, he's going to turn off the lights, so the universe is going to be dark, right? That's the sign. That's the sign that God promised that he would give us that the day of the Lord is going to come. Now, notice I'm on verse 29. I want you to watch carefully the sequence tonight. I'm just going to go verse by verse here. That's verse 29. I'm just going to go forward one verse and watch what happens. The universe is dark at this time. And look at the very next verse. Jesus says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of, the man, Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Jesus tells us in this verse that he's going to break through that darkness. He's going to come on the clouds with power and great glory. Jesus is going to burst through that darkness. He's going to light up the sky with his glory. That's verse 30. Now watch this. I'm going to go forward one verse. I'm just going to move forward one verse, and look what Jesus says next. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. I believe that Jesus is teaching that this is the rapture right here. He's going to gather his elect. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of evidence on that. Again, something for you to consider. Let's go back to the sequence Jesus gives us. Jesus said the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. Then he's going to come in power and great glory. And then he's going to rapture his church right here before he pours out the day of the Lord, which is exactly what he told us, right? The sun, moon, and stars is the sign of the day of the Lord. 
Let me, let me go through that again. When the sun, moon, and stars go dark, that's the sign that Jesus said he would give us that the day of the Lord is about to start. So again, if Jesus has the sun, moon, and stars going dark over here, the day of the Lord cannot start over here, right? And so Jesus told us that, he's, that we're not destined for wrath. I mean, I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul told us that in 1 Thessalonians, that we're not destined for wrath. Well, God's going to rapture us right here before he pours out his wrath. We're going to be saved from that, which is exactly what we're told. Now, I want to go to the parallel verses in Mark. So this is Jesus teaching in the Olivet Discourse. We looked at Matthew 24. I just want to go through the same verses now in the Gospel of Mark. This is Jesus speaking again. And look what Jesus said. In the days after that tribulation, the sun will be dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. So again, Jesus has the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here, right? Okay. Watch the sequence of verses again. Very important. Uh, verse 25 right here. I'm going to go forward. Well, what's the universe going to look like at this time? It's going to be dark, right? I'm going to go forward one verse. I'm just going to go forward one verse and watch what Jesus says. The universe is dark, and Jesus says, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Again, Jesus is going to break through that darkness. He's going to light up the sky with his glory. And look at the very next verse. Jesus said he'll send forth his angels, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the heaven. Now, you're going to notice that Jesus worded it a little bit different here in the Gospel of Mark. And I want you to catch this wording. Jesus said he's going to gather his elect. And look what he's going to do. He's going to gather them from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the heaven. Now, again, I'm not here to tell you what to believe. I'm just here to give you some things to think about. That sure sounds to me like the rapture, that Jesus is going to gather us from the farthest end of the earth up to the farthest end of heaven. I believe that Jesus is teaching the rapture here right before he's going to pour out the day of the Lord, which is exactly what he said that we're not destined for his wrath, right? So think about this over here now. Very important to get this. The folks who believe in the pre-trib rapture, remember I've showed you, they believe that the day of the Lord starts over there. But there's a major biblical problem here. We don't have any verses in the Bible that have the sun, moon, and stars going dark over there. None. Zero. Not a single passage. And folks, in all honesty, if there was a single passage that had it over there, I would show it to you. I would prefer to get raptured over there. But there's not one passage in the entire Bible that has the sun, moon, and stars going dark over there, and Jesus himself has it going dark over here. That's pretty hard to get around. Jesus said the sun, moon, and stars will go dark immediately after the tribulation of these days. Now notice again what Jesus said. The sun, moon, and stars will go dark after these days. Not before. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun, moon, and stars will go dark. That's pretty powerful. I used to believe in that view. I used to believe in the pre-trib view. This is one of many things that is, over the years, is the weight of the scriptures here have convinced me that this view is probably more accurate. Now, again, I'm not dogmatic about it. Can't prove it with 100% certainty, but we get a lot of powerful evidence from Jesus. Now, last week we said, well, what if we could go to the New Testament and get somebody else to help us on this? It's always good to have two witnesses rather than one. So we said, well, maybe we can get the Apostle John to help us. After all, uh, God chose the Apostle John to write the book of Revelation, so maybe John could help us. And so we asked this question. Did John speak clearly about the sign of the day of the Lord? And again, I mean a real clear verse. I don't mean some vague thing, again, that can be you know, interpreted a lot of different ways. Did John the Apostle speak clearly about the sun, moon, and stars going dark? And the answer to that question is yes, he did. It's right here in Revelation 6. John said, I looked when he broke the sixth seal. He's talking about Jesus. And John said, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made, of, sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. John's telling us the same thing. The sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. And just like Jesus, John not only tells us this, John tells us when it's going to happen. He said it's going to happen when Jesus breaks the sixth seal. So when Jesus breaks the sixth seal on the scroll... The sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. So we have to put this in context again, right? Jesus said, or John said that when Jesus breaks the sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars will go dark. Now, so John, the apostle, has the sun, moon, and stars going dark right here at the sixth seal. Now, you'll remember last week I told you that I was going to give you the long answer to this question, right? So that's what I'm going to do later this evening. Later this evening, I'm going to walk you through seal one, two, three, four, five, and show you how we arrive here that that's where the sixth seal is. But if you remember from last session, I gave you a real good answer how we know it's here. 
I gave you the short answer last week. I'm going to give you the short answer again tonight, right now. And then later I'll take you to the long answer. But here's the short answer. How do we know that this spot right here is where the sixth seal gets broken? And the simple answer to that is this. John says he's just agreeing with Jesus. And that's where Jesus has it. And so the apostle John says, I'm just agreeing with my Lord. It happens right here. Now, that's exactly what we should expect. As I shared with you last week, Jesus isn't going to tell us one thing and then have the Apostle John tell us something else and give us a different timing. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense at all. So the, the short answer is that John has the sixth seal right there where Jesus has, has it, and I'm going to walk you through the long answer in just a little bit. All right, so what does the universe look like at this time? Well, Jesus breaks the sixth seal. Sun, moon, and stars go dark, so the universe is dark. Well, if John's going to be consistent with what Jesus said, what's the very next thing we should expect? Well, we should expect that sky to peel back, and we should see Jesus coming in power and great glory. I want you to notice where I'm at. Revelation 6, I'm in verses 12 and 13. I'm going to take you to the very next verse. This is verse 13. Watch what happens in verse 14. The sky peels back. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. God rolls back the sky. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And look what happens. The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich people and the strong people and every slave and every free man. That's everybody. These are unbelievers. Look what they're doing. The sky peels back and they start hiding themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. The people of this earth start running to hide. Why? Why are they running to hide? Well, God tells us. They said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? I want you to connect this now. The people of the earth, the unbelievers, when that sky peels back, they're running to hide. Why? Because they can look up and see God the Father on the throne. That sky peels back and they can look up. They can see the presence of him who sits on the throne. And they're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath. Who's their wrath? God the Father and God the Son. John's telling us that their wrath, the wrath of God, the wrath of his Son, starts right here. Folks, the day of the Lord starts over here. That's why these people are running to hide. They weren't running to hide over here. They're running to hide over here because the day of the Lord is getting ready to start and they know it. The universe just went dark. Everybody on this planet is going to know that's a sign from God. And they look up and that sky peels back and they're like, we are in big trouble. We've made the wrong decision. And they're going to run and they're going to hide. Now notice what Jesus said about us in Luke. Jesus said when that happens, when the unbelievers see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory, Jesus tells us as believers... We don't need to run and hide. Jesus tells us to do the exact opposite. Jesus said, when these things take place, you stand up and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. So folks, if you're alive on planet Earth at that time and that sun goes dark, start looking up because Jesus is going to burst through that and he's going to take you to be with him. It's amazing, isn't it? All right, let's go back to what John said. So the sky splits apart, right? The sky rolls up. Jesus comes in power and great glory. And look what John tells us happens in the next chapter. John says, after these things, after what things? After those things he just told us about. After the sun goes dark, sun, moon, and stars go dark. After the sky lights up, John said, I looked and there was a great multitude. This is the raptured church, I believe. There's a great multitude. Where did they come from? Every nation, tribe, people, and tongues. And look what they're doing. They're standing before God's throne. And they're before the Lamb. And they're clothed in white robes. And they have palm branches in their hand. And why are they doing that? Well, they just got raptured. They have new resurrection bodies. So they're able to stand before the throne. They're clothed in white robes and they can hold palm branches in their hand. So John gives us the same sequence Jesus gave us. Sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark. Jesus is going to come in power and great glory. And then he's going to rapture the church right here before he pours out his wrath, right? Now, John was even asked about this. One of the elders said to John, John, these that are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where'd they come from? And John says, I don't know, but you know. And one of the elders said to John, well, these are the ones who came out of the Great Tribulation. Now think about that. Yes, these are Christians who came out of the Great Tribulation when Jesus cut it short. Jesus is cutting this short because if he doesn't, we're all going to get killed. So Jesus said he's going to cut these days short because if he doesn't, none of us are going to survive. He cuts those days short and he raptures us out right here before he pours out his wrath, right? There's the rapture right before God pours out the day of the Lord which is exactly what he told us, that we're not destined for his wrath. This just all comes together, right? The Apostle John has it happening right there, not over here. So I want you to notice again that the sun, moon, and stars go dark over here, 
not over there, right? John has it over here, which is the same place Jesus had it. So here's the sequence again. Jesus says the sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. He's going to come in power and great glory. He's going to rapture us right here before he pours out his wrath during a time period called the day of the Lord. The sun, moon, and stars going dark is that universal sign that he promised he would give us. That has to happen before God pours out the day of the Lord. If the sun, moon, and stars doesn't go dark until here, the day of the Lord cannot start over here, right? So it's just an amazing harmony when we look at the scriptures. John teaches the same thing that Jesus did. So again, we have perfect harmony between Jesus and the Apostle John. And I always share with folks, if you were to open this up and, and you believe that this is a word from God, isn't that what you would expect? I mean, I would expect that if God's going to, if Jesus himself is going to tell us something and he's going to have the Apostle John write the last book of the Bible, I would expect it to be in perfect harmony. And when I open my Bible, that's in perfect harmony. It's exactly what you would expect if this is true, that this is a word from God. Now, we said, well, what if we could get a third witness? Well, we've already got two, and that went together just like pieces of a puzzle. But what if we could get a third witness? What if we could go to the New Testament, we could get one other person to help us out? How about the man who wrote most of the New Testament? This was God's chosen man to write most of the New Testament. Can the Apostle Paul help us with the day of the Lord? Well, it turns out he can. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't talk about the day of the Lord in terms of the sign of the sun, moon, and stars. The Apostle Paul gives us another indicator that helps us have some clarification on this, okay? So we're gonna to go to 2 Thessalonians, a clear rapture passage, and look what the Apostle Paul said. Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, Paul said, we ask you brothers not to become unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, some report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Notice what Paul's saying here. Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. This is one of the clearest teachings on the rapture in the Bible. This is from the Apostle Paul. This is an indisputable rapture passage. Regardless of when you think the rapture will happen, this is one of the passages that's talking about the rapture. But notice that Paul said the rapture is connected to the day of the Lord. Now that's verse two. Again, I'm just gonna go forward one verse. Watch what Paul says in the very next verse. Paul says, and don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you. Paul said that day, what day? The day of the Lord. It's not gonna come until what? It's not going to come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. Paul says the day of the Lord is not going to start until the Antichrist is revealed. Well, when is he going to be revealed? Well, let's put all three of those verses together. Now I've got all three verses, and let's just walk through this. Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, that's the rapture. Paul said the rapture is connected to the day of the Lord. And Paul said that day, what day? That day, the day of the Lord. Paul said the day of the Lord is not going to happen until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And we've already learned that the Antichrist will be revealed at the midpoint when he sets himself up in the temple. So now let's go put that on a timeline, right? Well, let me show you 1 Thessalonians first, and then I'll come back to the timeline. This is the classic passage on the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul said the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And Paul said after that, we are still alive and are left. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will be with the Lord forever. And Paul said, encourage each other with these words. Now, I want you to notice that was 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 18. Now, that's where the chapter ends. All right, so chapter 5 begins with the next verse. But keep in mind, again, that when the Bible was written, there were no chapter breaks, right? These were added later. So all I'm going to do now is give you the same passage, but I'm going to add the very next verse. So here we go, same passage, I'm just adding the verse. Paul said that we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Paul said, Now, brothers, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He's talking about to unbelievers. But notice the connection here. Paul says our being caught up is connected to the day of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul teaches us that the day of the Lord and the rapture are connected. Now, here's where it gets exciting. I'm going to put this on the timeline. Let's go to the timeline now. Same verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Look what Paul said. Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. That's the rapture. Paul said it's connected to the day of the Lord. Paul said the rapture and the day of the Lord are connected. And the next verse is really, really important. Verse 3, look at it again. Paul said, and don't let anyone deceive you. That day, that day, what day? This day. The day of the Lord, Paul said, this day is not going to happen until the man of lawlessness is revealed. He's talking about the Antichrist, and we know when the Antichrist will be revealed. 
He'll be revealed when he sets himself up in the temple and declares himself to be God. So notice what Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the day of the Lord happens after that. The Apostle Paul has the day of the Lord happening over here, just like Jesus did and just like John did. And now we have perfect harmony from three, probably the three most important witnesses we can have in the New Testament. Jesus himself, the Apostle John, and the Apostle Paul all tell us that the day of the Lord starts over here. It does not start over there. Now, there's some Christians who hold that view that have looked at this evidence and said, you're right. It can't be there. The day of the Lord can't be there. It has to be over here after the sixth seal. Now, one of those is John MacArthur. And again, I have nothing but the utmost respect for John MacArthur. I've shared with you a couple times. He's my favorite pastor in the whole world. I just love this man. Here's what he said in his study Bible. The previous five seals will be precursors to the full fury of the day of the Lord, which will begin with the sixth seal. He's acknowledging that the day of the Lord has to start over here with the sixth seal. It can't be over there. Now, here's the interesting part. And this is where John and I differ a little bit. John says that he acknowledges that the day of the Lord starts over here, but he still believes that the rapture is over there. But as much as I love him and as much as I respect him, folks, I just don't see that in the scriptures. I just don't because we have this sequence from Jesus. Jesus is going to break the sixth seal. The sun, moon, and stars is going to go dark over here. Then Jesus said he's coming in power and great glory. He indicates to us that he's going to rapture us right here before he pours out the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord starts over here. So according to Jesus, you can't have that time gap. You can't have the day of the Lord starting over here and the rapture over there. According to Jesus, that doesn't fit. Right? Now, think about what the Apostle Paul said. Paul said regarding the rapture, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, Paul said that's connected to the day of the Lord. Paul said the rapture and the day of the Lord are connected. But verse 3 is the critical verse. Look what Paul said. And Paul said that day. What day? This day. Paul said the day of the Lord is not going to happen until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And again, we know that the Antichrist gets revealed right here at the midpoint. That's when he walks into the temple, declares himself to be God. That's when he's revealed to the world for who he truly is. And the Apostle Paul said the day of the Lord happens after that. Paul tells us that the day of the Lord happens after that. So again, you can't have this time gap. Now, this book here is called Antichrist Before the Day of the Lord. It's written by a man named Alan Kirshner. Uh, the subtitle is What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Return of Christ. Um, I would encourage you to get that book because I think that is one of the most biblical books out there today on the end times. I think it is totally, totally based on the scriptures. And um, I would really encourage you to get that book. Um, now, Alan, the author of this book, he also does a Bible prophecy program on his podcast. He calls it the Bible prophecy program. And here's an episode that he aired on October 22nd, 2014. And he said this, he said, the 800 pound gorilla is second Thessalonians chapter two. He said, pre-tribulationists just cannot get around that passage. It explicitly teaches that the church will be here when the Antichrist is revealed. So let me go back and show that verse to you again. I want you to see that in chapter two, all right? He said, this is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Notice what Paul said here again. Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, that's the rapture. Paul said the rapture is connected to the day of the Lord. The rapture and the day of the Lord are connected. And again, verse three, Paul said, don't let anyone deceive you because that day, the day of the Lord, it's not going to happen until the Antichrist is revealed. The Antichrist is revealed right here. So Paul's telling us that the rapture and the day of the Lord have to happen after that. And so Alan says, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Pre-tribulationists just cannot get around that passage. That passage explicitly teaches that the church we will be here when the Antichrist is revealed. It doesn't appear that the rapture is over there. It's pretty powerful, pretty powerful evidence. Again, this is something that really swayed me. I just don't know how you get around that. It's pretty, pretty convincing scriptures. Now, I want to go back to Matthew 24, 31. We talked about this a little bit last week again. The big question is, was Jesus really talking about the rapture here? Because you have to remember, the Christians who teach that the rapture is over here, they say that's not the rapture. Remember last week I shared three different views they give you on what that is. But they say that's not the rapture because we've got the rapture happening over here. Well, let's look at the sequence again that Jesus gave us. In verse 29, Jesus said the sun, moon, and stars would go dark over here. In verse 30, Jesus said he's going to break through that darkness. He's going to come in power and great glory. And right here in verse 31, he said he's going to gather his elect. Okay? 
So is he talking about the rapture? Well, I think he's talking about the rapture. We get a little more confirmation, a little more clarity here when we go to the Gospel of Mark. Remember, Jesus said he's going to gather his elect from the farthest ends of the earth to the farthest ends of the heaven. So as I've shared with you folks in the beginning, I don't want you to believe anything I say in this entire seminar unless you see it on the pages of your Bible. All I'm asking you to do tonight is to weigh these out for yourself. Remember, I'm not here to convince you to believe what I believe. I only want you to believe what this book convinces you to believe. But for me, when I weigh this out, this is pretty powerful evidence, right? Now, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to go back to this and see if the Apostle Paul can give us some help here. All right, let me just get a sip of water here. I'm going to see if the Apostle Paul can give us some clarity on whether Jesus was really talking about the rapture here. So let's take a look at this and see if Paul can give us some help. And remember, we're going to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture. So I'm going to go back to Alan's book. And I'm going to take a chart out of that book. It's on page 179 of that book. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see the parallels between Jesus and Paul. Right? We're going to take a look at Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24, which we were just looking at. And we're going to look at what Paul had to say in the classic passages on the rapture. And again, Alan gives 30 parallels here. Well, I don't have time to go through all 30. We're going to be here for another session. All right? So we can't do that. So I can't go through all 30 tonight. So I'm just going to go through a few. I'm going to take a little snapshot of that chart. We're just going to go through a few. And I'm going to focus in on two from verse 30. This is Matthew 24, 30, and we're going to compare that to 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Notice that we're going to see Jesus coming with the clouds, and we're going to see Jesus coming with power and great glory. So here we go. Jesus said, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Tribes of the earth will mourn. They're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Jesus said he'll be coming on the clouds. Over here, the Apostle Paul said that we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. They're both talking about Jesus coming in the clouds, right? We'll also see that they both talk about power and great glory. Jesus said they're going to see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. Paul said that unbelievers will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. They'll be cast away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. They're both talking about Jesus coming in power and great glory. So we have those two parallels right there. Okay, now I want to focus on three parallels from Matthew 24, 31. Three parallels where we're going to look at what Jesus said compared to what Paul said. And again, these are the classic passages on the rapture. So here we go. All right, now let me back up again. We're going to see an angelic presence. We're going to see a trumpet call, and we're going to see the gathering. So let's start with the first one. Jesus said he's going to send forth his angels. So there we have angels. Paul said the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. And then in 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Paul said that um, Jesus is going to give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. They're both talking about Jesus coming with angels, right? Okay, so we see that one. The second one is a trumpet call. Notice what Jesus said. He's going to send his angels. They're going to come with a great trumpet. Apostle Paul said the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. They're both talking about the trumpet call. So we see that parallel. From Jesus' words to Paul, we have harmony again. Now here's where it gets really, really interesting. These are the most important verses right here. We're going to see that they're both talking about the gathering. And keep in mind that these are the major passages on the rapture. So here we go. Jesus said he's going to send forth his angels with the great trumpet. They will gather together his elect. Notice what the Apostle Paul said. First Thessalonians, he said, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. That's a gathering. Look at Second Thessalonians. With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. They're both talking about the gathering. Jesus is talking about the gathering. The Apostle Paul is talking about the gathering at the rapture. They're both talking about that it's going to happen in the sky. Jesus said it's going to happen from one end of the sky to the other, and Paul said we're going to meet the Lord in the air. I don't want you to miss this. This is really important. These are the most important passages in the Bible on the rapture. They are the, the classic passages describing the rapture from the Apostle Paul, and Jesus is saying the exact same things that the Apostle Paul is saying. And again, you would expect that. If this is a word from God, you would expect Jesus' words to line up perfectly with the Apostle Paul, and that's exactly what we see when we go here. And Paul's talking about the rapture. So when I weigh this out, is Jesus talking about the rapture in verse 31? I think so. He's saying the exact same things that the Apostle Paul is saying. That's pretty powerful to me. So when I weigh this out and ask myself this question, is Jesus referring to the rapture? I'd have to say yes. This is clearly the rapture over here. But again, I'm not here to tell you what to believe. Remember I told you that I've my purpose is just to put a stone in your shoe. I want you to have something to think about when you leave here tonight. And I want you to have some scriptures to go back and weigh them out and come to your own conclusion on this. 
that appears to me that they're talking about the same thing. So everything we've seen so far is this. The biblical evidence reveals that the day of the Lord begins over here, right? Not over there, right? We don't see any biblical evidence that the day of the Lord begins over there. Everything that we've looked at so far reveals that the biblical evidence is that the day of the Lord is over here. Now, Jesus told us the day of the Lord starts over here. The Apostle John indicates to us that the day of the Lord starts over here. The Apostle Paul indicates to us that the day of the Lord starts over here. Boy, when I weigh that out, that's pretty powerful. It's pretty hard to go against those three. Um, Sixth seal is the sign of the day of the Lord. Sun, moon, and stars go dark. Jesus comes in power and great glory. He's going to rapture us right here before he pours out the day of the Lord. Seems to me that we have perfect harmony here between Jesus Christ himself, the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation, and the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. That is what swayed me. I used to believe in this view. Today, I believe this is more likely. Again, I'm not dogmatic about it. I actually hope this is wrong because I don't really want to be here to face the Antichrist. With all my heart, I wish that's right. But when I open the Bible, I just don't see that. So folks, as I said, part of the, one of the goals of this seminar is to get you thinking about the end times. Another goal is to get you prepared for the future. I want to be prepared for this in case that's where the rapture happens and I'm alive at this time when the Antichrist sets himself up in that temple and starts killing Christians. I want to be prepared for that. I want everyone that I love and care about to be prepared for that. So it's just something that I want you to think about. And again, you can decide for yourself. I believe that God's teaching us that the rapture is going to be happening right here because that's where he told us that we're not destined for wrath. And when I look at this, there's just a mountain of evidence over here. There's just a mountain of evidence that I can't get around as much as I would like that other view to be true. And the more I've thought about this over the years, none of this should surprise us because Jesus said he wants to show us what's going to take place. So again, the goal of this seminar is not to convince you to believe what I believe. The goal of this seminar is to get you thinking about the end times and to help prepare you for the future. And as I've shared with you, you're all intelligent Christians, and I only want you to believe what the scriptures convince you to believe. All right, there's a lot of information there. So now I'm going to walk you through that chronology and give you the long answer. Okay, so take a deep breath now. We've covered a lot. Let me get a sip of water here. I know you've got, there's a lot to absorb. Uh, that's why I'm so excited that these videos are going to be on the Internet. So you can have a chance to rewatch them again. Um, every time I've taught this seminar, I've had people walk out going, boy, I wish I could go back and look at all the scriptures again. So now you'll be able to do that. All right, what I want to do now is I want to try to walk you through a chronology of events of the 70th week. You can notice I have B, 70, 70th week there. That just stands for beginning of the 70th week. E is the end of the 70th week. This is day of the Lord. Great tribulation. And I bet you know what MP stands for? The midpoint. See, you're all road scholars. I knew you were going to get that, <laughs> right? So there's a little timeline there. I just want to lay this out for you because I'm going to be putting some things down there. And we're going to see if we can get the chronology here. Now, uh, again, we have to go back to Revelation chapter 5. John said he saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. John sees God the Father sitting on the throne. He's holding a scroll. It's sealed with seven seals. And John said he saw a mighty angel saying, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? So John asked, who can open this scroll? And John said, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. So the apostle John starts to weep. He said he began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy who could open that scroll. But then one of the elders said to John, he said, John, don't weep anymore. He said, stop weeping. The lion from the tribe of Judah, he is overcome. He can open the book and it's seven seals. Well, that's Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can open this scroll, right? And when Jesus opens this scroll, this is where we're introduced to the four horsemen of the apocalypse that you're probably pretty familiar with. So let's walk through this. Let's see if we can walk through this here. All right, so John says when Jesus opened the first seal, John said he heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. And there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, just briefly, before I start talking about these riders on the horses, I want to remind you again about these four living creatures. Who are these four living creatures? Well, we have to go back a couple chapters to get that, right? Revelation chapter 4. John said, Before the throne there was something like a sea of glass like crystal. And in the center and around the throne there was these four living creatures, and they're full of eyes in front and behind. In front of God's throne we have these four living creatures, and they're just full of eyes. And John says that the first creature was like a lion, the second was like a calf, the third had the face like that of a man, and the fourth was like that of a flying eagle. So we have these four living creatures before God's throne. And remember, each of them have six wings, and they're full of eyes all around. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy. 
is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And so in the very throne room of God, we see these four living creatures and they're just praising God around the clock. He's holy, holy, holy. He's perfect and majestic and awesome. And he's so worthy to receive praise. And it's these four living creatures. One of them called out in a loud voice. He said, come. And when he said that, we could get a rider on the white horse. Now, I want you to notice what John tells us about the rider on the white horse. It says he held a bow, but notice he doesn't have any arrows. The rider on this white horse has a bow, but no arrows. And we're told that he was given a crown. The implication is he didn't earn one. He was given one. And we're told that he came out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. Well, who is this rider on the first horse? Well, many theologians believe this is the Antichrist. And notice that he came with a bow, but no arrows. But he comes to conquer. But most people believe he's going to conquer at first with diplomacy, right? We know he's going to confirm that covenant with the nation of Israel. So when he first arrives on the scene, people aren't going to know that he's the Antichrist, right? The world's not going to know that. Israel's not going to sign a peace treaty with a man they know is the Antichrist. He's going to appear very charismatic at first, right? He's going to do something that presidents have never been able to do, that prime ministers have never been able to do. He's going to solve the Middle East peace crisis. So many theologians believe that rider on the first horse, that's the Antichrist, and he's going to come here at the beginning of the 70th week, and he's going to sign that covenant with the nation of Israel. All right. John says when the lamb opened the second seal, he heard the second living creature say, come. And another horse came out, this time a fiery red one. This rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other, and to him was given a large sword. Well, now we have this rider on the red horse. People are going to kill each other. So we have that time period of peace, and now we have this rider on the red horse, and now all of a sudden we have war. See, there is going to be peace in the Middle East, but it's not going to last very long. Now, we don't know how far along into this that we're going to switch from peace to war. We just know when the second rider comes out, we have a time period of war. I think it's really, really possible that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war could occur at that time. I'm not dogmatic about it, but the reason I think it's a good possibility is because we're told that Russia and Iran and their allies are going to come against Israel in a time when Israel is living in a land of unwalled villages. Well, right now, Israel's not living in a land of unwalled villages, and they're not about to let their guard down. If you watch the news lately, you see that Israelis are being stabbed right now. There's been multiple stabbings in, in Israel the last few days. They're just being stabbed on the streets. Um, there's no way they're going to let their guard down until they have a peace treaty. So once Israel signs a peace treaty with the Antichrist and they think that everything's okay, um, then they will probably be living in a land of unwalled villages. So again, I'm not dogmatic about that that war will happen there, but I think it's a good possibility. There also might be some other wars, but the point I want you to see is that we're going to progress from a time period of peace to a time period of war, so we're moving a little further along the calendar. Now, how far, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to take us, you know, one year in or two years in, or we don't know exactly where, but we know we're going to have war. All right, John says when the lamb opened the third seal, when Jesus opened the third seal, he said, I saw, or the third living creature said, come, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And John said, I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. Well, after we have that time period of war, we're going to have a time period of famine, right? When you have war, you have famine. And so we're going to have a loss of food. It's going to take a whole day's wages just to get a quart of wheat. It's going to take a whole day's wages to get three quarts of barley. And we're told don't damage the oil and the wine because they're going to be very rare at that time and you don't want to damage them. So following that period of war, we're going to have a period of famine. So again, what I want you to notice here is that we're moving along this time frame. And again, God doesn't give us a specific time here in terms of months or you know, days or anything, but we have a time of peace. That'll last for a while. Then we're going to have war. And then we're going to have famine, all right? So now we go to the fourth horse. When Jesus opened the fourth seal, John said, I heard the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. So we get the rider on the fourth horse, the pale horse, and now we have Death. Well, you would expect that. After a time period of war and a time period of famine, you would expect Death. So we're moving a little closer to this halfway point. Right? Possibly now we are all the way to the halfway point. We've had a time of peace with the first seal. We've had some war. We've had famine. And now we have death. So we're, we're, we're either close to that midpoint or right around it, I think, is a reasonable conclusion that we're moving along that time frame. Okay, now, when Jesus opened the fifth seal, notice what happens here. John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Well, now we have more death, but I want you to notice specifically this is Christian death. 
Look who gets killed now. Those who hold to the word of God. We have Christians being killed. Why? Because they held to the word of God and they held to their testimony. So now, look what happens here. This is very important that you catch this. Please stay with me now. This is really important. You've got to really catch this. We have Christians being killed, right? They're holding to the word of God and their testimony. So now the Christians are being killed and look what they say. They're crying out to God. And they said, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? These Christians that just got killed, they're crying out to God and they're saying, God, how long before you judge the inhabitants of the earth? How long before you avenge our blood? Folks, I want you to notice these people were not killed by God during the day of the Lord. God doesn't martyr his own children. They're crying out to God and saying, God, when are you going to take care of the people who just killed us, right? And each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. So now we have, with the opening of the fifth seal, we have under the altar the souls of those who were slain because of the word of God. This is Christian death. Well, God's not killing his own children here. Folks, this is not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord hasn't come yet. We're only at the fifth seal, right? Paul said that we don't go through the wrath of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians, Paul said that we're going to be rescued from the coming wrath. And Paul said God has not destined us for his wrath, right? And in these contexts here in 1 Thessalonians, he was talking about the day of the Lord, right? So these are Christians. Now think about that. Since the fifth seal martyrs are Christians being killed, this can't be the day of the Lord. And this lines up perfectly with what we've already learned, right? The day of the Lord doesn't start over there. This isn't God's wrath the whole seven years. The day of the Lord doesn't start over there, right? We didn't see the sun, moon, and stars going dark over there. Even John MacArthur says the day of the Lord has to start over here with the sixth seal. Now think about that. We haven't arrived at the sixth seal yet. Very important it gets this. We haven't arrived at the sixth seal yet. Look where we're at on the time frame. We're at the fifth seal. Time of peace, followed by war, followed by famine, followed by death, followed by Christian death. Well, we haven't arrived at the sixth seal yet. We're only at the fifth seal. So what's going on here? What's taking place at the midpoint that all these Christians are going to be killed? Well, let's go back and learn that again. Wow. Look at this. What's going on at the midpoint? Well, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple. He's going to pose himself above everything that's called God. He's going to take a seat in the temple of God and display himself as being God. And Daniel tells us in verse 927, that will happen at the midpoint. Remember, all this is going on at the midpoint. We have this other beast. He's going to make those who dwell on the earth worship the Antichrist. Right? We learned this earlier tonight. He's going to make fire come down out of heaven. And he's going to do this in the presence of men. He's going to deceive those who are on the earth because of the signs it was given to him perform in the presence of the Antichrist. He's going to tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and came to life. And we're told that the false prophet is going to deceive the people on the earth because he's going to perform these signs. Now, I sometimes have people ask me, I'm really worried about this. Is it possible that me or my family could be deceived? As a matter of fact, I was asked this question last week at the end of class. I was asked this question last week. Is it possible that as a true Christian that I could be deceived by this false prophet? And the answer to that is no. If you're a true Christian, you will not be deceived. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a pretty bold statement for you to make. Well, I'm not making it. Jesus is. Jesus says this. Jesus says at that time, at this time, Jesus said, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ. If anyone tells you that this is the Christ, that there he is, Jesus said, don't believe it. Jesus said, false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs. That's what he's going to do, right? You see the harmony in the Bible again? John tells us that this false prophet is going to perform great signs. And Jesus said there will be four false prophets who will perform great signs. And Jesus says when you see that, they're going to deceive even the elect if that was possible. Folks, here's the good news. Because you've come to this seminar, and it's not because of me. It's just because I've opened the Bible for you. You're not going to get caught off guard now. You know what to look for. Every one of you in this room now and every one of you watching on video, you know what to look for now. You're not going to be deceived because Jesus says that's not possible for a true believer, right? Jesus said, I told you ahead of time. Wow. But he is going to perform great signs. This false prophet will perform great signs. He will deceive those who dwell on the earth. He'll deceive the unbelievers. They'll believe it. 
He's going to tell those who dwell on the earth to make his image of the beast, right? He's going to cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So if you don't worship the image of the beast here, you're going to be killed. That's exactly what's going on here. Fifth seal martyrs, Christians being killed. Where? Right here. After the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, declares himself to be God, and everyone's told that they have to take a mark on their right hand or their forehead, and if you don't worship the image of the beast, you're going to be killed. And some Christians are going to be killed. Folks, the reality is that some Christians are going to be killed here, and John says that many of us are going to be beheaded. We have to be prepared for that should that unfold. So where's God's wrath? That's not God's wrath. God's wrath starts here with the sixth seal, right? We learned that earlier tonight. God's wrath starts over here with the breaking of the sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars going dark. Then the sky is split apart, and that's why the people of the earth are running and hiding. They're running and hiding in the caves and in the rocks, and they said, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. Please make sure you understand this before you walk out tonight. This is really what I want to accomplish here tonight. I want you to understand that God's wrath doesn't start until here. That's why the unbelievers of the world are running to hide right here because the sky just got peeled open. They look up. They know that God's wrath is right here. They weren't running and hiding over here. This is God's wrath over here. The fifth seal was not God's wrath. God's wrath is right here. The first mention of God's wrath is after the sixth seal. And that's what God told us he would do. God said, I'm going to give you a sign before I pour out my wrath. The sun, moon, and stars are going to go dark. Everybody will know that. You will not get caught off guard. It's going to happen right here, and you know what to look for, right? This is it. The sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars goes dark. This is where it is. It's the first mentions of God's wrath. That's why the unbelievers are hiding. And they said, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. Hide us from the wrath of the lamb. Yes, they recognize that God's wrath starts right here. Folks, this is where God's wrath starts. Then what about all this? What about all this wrath that was going on before the day of the Lord? Whose wrath is that? Well, the Bible gives us an amazing answer. Watch this. Going back to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. John says, she gave birth to a son. Who gave birth to a son? Israel gave birth to a son. What son? This son. A male child who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. We're told that Israel gave birth to a son, this son, a male child who will rule all the nations. Now, some people will look at this verse and say, well, no, it was Mary. Mary gave birth to his son. How do you know this isn't talking about Mary? How do you know this is talking about Israel? Watch the next verse. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her by God so that she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, Mary's not here on planet Earth, and Mary's not running to hide for 1,260 days, right? This is the Israelis. This is the Jewish people. God tells us that Israel gave birth to his son, they gave birth to Jesus, and God's going to protect some of the Jews. He's going to nourish them for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. Once the Antichrist sets himself up in that temple and starts to kill Jews and Christians, God tells us he's going to protect some of the Jews. They're going to flee, right? And that's going to happen when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and declares himself to be God. And by the way, isn't that what Jesus said to do? Jesus said, flee. Jesus said, when you see this, when you see the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple, flee. Get moving. Because he's going to start killing the Jews and Christians in Jerusalem first. And Jesus said, get out of there, because then there's going to be great tribulation that's not happened since the beginning of the world. So John says the same thing. The Jews fled. This is exactly what Jesus said to do. Get out of there. So God's going to protect them for 1,260 days. Now I want you to notice that's Revelation 12, 5, and 6. The verses I'm about to show you are some of the most staggering verses in the entire Bible. We're at the midpoint here, right? Watch the next verse. And there was a war in heaven. A war in heaven? When we think of heaven, we don't normally think about a war. Yeah, there's going to be a war in heaven. Unbelievable. Well, who's going to be fighting? Well, there's going to be a war in heaven, and God tells us who's going to be fighting. There's a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels are waging war with the dragon. The archangel Michael and his angels are waging war with the dragon, but we're told the dragon and his angels waged war, but they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is a staggering verse. God, these verses, God tells us there's going to be a war in heaven. And the archangel Michael and his angels are going to fight against Satan and his angels, but Satan and his angels aren't strong enough, and Satan gets permanently kicked out of heaven. Now, by the way, Satan's not omnipresent. 
God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at once. Satan's just like you and me. He can only be in one place at a time. Right now, Satan has access to heaven. The Bible tells us that Satan has access to heaven right now, that he can go up to heaven and he can tell God what sinners we are. He's the accuser of the brethren. The apostle Peter tells us that sometimes Satan's down here roaming around, roaming around like a lion, seeking who he can devour. But Satan can only be in one place at one time. And Satan doesn't want to go to hell any more than you do. Matter of fact, Satan's never been to hell yet. He doesn't live in hell. Right now he has access to heaven and he has access to the earth. But we're told here at the midpoint that he's going to get kicked out of heaven. He will no longer have access to heaven. Now watch what happens next. John says, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on them. Heaven's going to rejoice because Satan's getting kicked out. But watch this. John says, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. At the midpoint, Satan himself will be permanently kicked out of heaven, and he is coming here. And he's coming with great wrath. Watch this. It's amazing because he knows he has only a short time. How much time does he have? Well, he has from the time he gets kicked out of heaven, he has until Jesus decides to cut these days short. Satan has the length of time of the great tribulation until Jesus says, I'm cutting those days short so that no more believers get killed, and then Jesus will pour out his own day of the Lord. So we're told that the devil gets kicked out of heaven because him and his angels weren't strong enough, and he's coming down here to earth. And look at this. When he saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. First thing he's going to do is try to kill Jews. He's going to go after them. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so she could fly in the wilderness to her place where she was nursed for times, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. The Jewish people, again, are going to be protected by God. Some of the Jewish people will be protected by God. God says this time it's going to be a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. God describes this period of time in three ways. He sometimes calls it 42 months. Sometimes he calls it 1,260 days. Here he calls it a time, times, and half a time. He refers to that last three and a half years in three different ways. So Satan goes after the Jewish people, but he can't get all of them. So look what happens next. He becomes enraged. He becomes enraged with the woman, so he goes off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Folks, that's us. That's Christians. He can't get to the Jews, so he starts killing Christians. He starts killing those who keep the commandments of God and who hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's Christians. He starts going after Christians, and here's how it's going to happen. We're told that Satan himself is going to empower the Antichrist, right? Satan gets kicked out of heaven at the midpoint. Satan himself is going to empower the Antichrist. He's going to give him his power, his throne, and great authority. And the Antichrist is going to make war with the saints and overcome them. Starting right here, the Antichrist will start killing Christians. And if we're going to be here, or if our children are going to be here, or if our grandchildren are going to be here, we probably should be prepared for this. Look what John says. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them had slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. Folks, this is Christians being killed right here at the midpoint. This can't be the day of the Lord. The fifth seal martyrs are Christians. They're being killed by the Antichrist. This can't be the day of the Lord. God's wrath hasn't started yet. God's wrath doesn't start till the sixth seal. This fits in perfect harmony. God just lays this out for us like breadcrumbs. Just lays it out for us. It's right there. Now look at this. The devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has only a short time. This is not the wrath of God. When these Christians are being killed here, this is not the wrath of God. Let me ask you this question. Does God martyr his own children? No. God does not kill his own children. This is the Antichrist killing Christians. It's not God killing Christians. We're not in the day of the Lord yet, right? All right, let's follow our sequence here. Now I've got the three and a half years here and the three and a half years here. The great tribulation begins at the midpoint. Satan himself gets kicked out of heaven. He comes down, he empowers the Antichrist. The Antichrist sets himself up in the temple. And we're told that the devil comes down to you having great wrath because he knows he has only a short time. He only has that much time. Or maybe he has this much time. Or maybe he has this much time. God doesn't tell us exactly where he's going to shorten that, but Jesus said, if I didn't cut those days short, none of you would survive. Satan and the Antichrist are going to start killing Christians. And Jesus says, if I let that run the whole three and a half years, None of you are going to make it out of there. So Jesus says, I'm going to cut those days short. So Jesus cuts it short, right? So it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Folks, the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. 
The first part of the second half of the three and a half years is the great tribulation, and that is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God hasn't started yet. Jesus said, if I don't cut those days short, no one's going to survive. So think about that. It's at the sixth seal when Jesus is going to cut those days short. It's at the sixth seal that we get the sign of the day of the Lord, right? Let's follow this. The sixth seal is the sign that God promised to give us before God pours out his wrath here. So when the Christians are being killed, that's not God's wrath. God's wrath hasn't started yet. The fifth seal martyrs are killed by the devil and by the Antichrist, and this all just goes together like pieces of a puzzle. When we open the Bible and we let it interpret itself, everything just falls right into place. Because God says he wants us to know this. And we're his children. And again, God didn't give us 65 books and say, oh, by the way, you can understand the first 65 books, and when you get to the last book, I'm going to confuse you so bad you'll never get it. Folks, that's not who he is. He's our father. There's not a single father in this room that would purposely confuse your children. And God's not confusing us. He's laid this out for us to watch. Now, when we come to the seventh seal, this is pretty staggering. When we come to the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Heaven goes completely silent. Not a sound. Not a sound in heaven. Not a sound from the four living creatures. Not a sound from the angels. Not a sound from the 24 elders before the throne. Not a sound from the raptured church. Heaven goes completely silent. Why? Well, think about what's happening here. All these inhabitants of heaven, they know what's going to happen next. And they go completely silent because this is what's going to happen next. That moment is going to arrive when God is going to pour out his wrath. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to bring distress on men because they have sinned against him. This is the time when God is going to come and bring his judgment against this world. And these are not pleasant verses to share with people. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. That's not a real popular message. Neither their silver or their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. All the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. These aren't real popular verses to share with people. And he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. And here's how God's going to do it. He's going to start to pour out his wrath with the seven trumpets. God said the seven angels who stand before God were given seven trumpets. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. God's wrath is going to start with the outpouring of the trumpets. These seals, these first five seals, these, these were not God's wrath. That wasn't God's wrath. God's wrath doesn't start till the breaking of the seventh seal and the inhabitants of heaven go silent because they realize the devastation that's about to unfold on this planet. Folks, I shared with you last session, the midpoint of the 70th week is going to be the most critical time in the history of this planet. Because at that time, everyone alive at this time is going to have to make a very important decision. Is this man God or is this man God? Everyone who's alive will have to make that decision. And those who say this man is God, they're going to be rewarded temporarily. But they're going to suffer eternally. And for those who say this man is God, it's just the opposite. They will suffer temporarily. And they might even get their head cut off. But they will be rewarded eternally. So that is going to be the most critical time in the history of this planet. But think about this. This will be the most tragic time in the history of this planet. Right here. In the second half of the 70th week. When God starts to pour out the day of the Lord. And God is going to come and God is going to remove every sinner from the face of this planet. And he's going to do that in a terrifying way. God is going to remove every sinner from the face of this planet. And look what we're told. God's going to send an angel, and the angel says this, If anyone worships the beast in his image, and you receive a mark on his forehead or on his hand, you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the full strength and the cup of his anger. I want to pause here for a minute, because I want you to realize the severity of that verse. God says, For anyone who takes the mark of the Antichrist on their hand or their forehead, you will receive the full wrath of God, in full strength, you will receive the cup of his un, 
diluted anger full strength. Wow. And they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. They will have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark on his name. Now, I've had people tell me, that sounds pretty severe. And I say, you have to read the verse. Make sure you don't miss what it says in that verse. Watch this. That does sound pretty severe. But look what they're doing. They're worshiping the beast. They're worshiping the Antichrist. These are people who will not worship the true Christ. These are people who have made a decision not to worship Jesus Christ. These are people who are worshiping the Antichrist. They not only embrace him, they're worshiping him. And we're told this, right? That they also worship Satan. They worship the dragon and they worship the beast. And so God says, if you do that, you're going to receive my full wrath. Folks, I would encourage you to tell everyone that you love, from your children to anyone else, and I've taught this to my daughter from the time she was a little kid, don't ever let anybody put a mark on your right hand or your forehead under any circumstances whatsoever because there appears to be no turning back. Make sure that everyone you know in your circle that you have shared this with them. This is very serious. This is coming from the Lord himself. And it doesn't have to be that way. And God doesn't want it to be that way. God says this. God said, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as Some call count slowness. He's patient towards you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. God does not want one person to face his wrath. He is so good. He is so loving. He is so merciful. God says, I gave you my son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. No one, no one has to face God's wrath. Everyone is given a free choice. And God loves us so much, he gives everyone a free choice. He even sends an angel to tell people, don't take that mark. He sends the first angel and says, worship the true Christ. He sends that third angel and says, don't take that mark. Everyone's going to know not to take that. So those seven years are going to be pretty bad especially those three and a half. But remember, for all eternity, everything is going to be perfect. For those of us who have accepted God's free offer, the gift of his son, Jesus is coming back here. He's going to rule and reign on this planet for 1,000 years. And from there, we go into all eternity. Now, for those of you that have been going to the End Times Question Group on Facebook, you'll notice that I was asked a question. It was, I was actually asked a question by someone here tonight. Why the millennium? Why doesn't God just take us right into eternity? And I have a fairly lengthy answer that I put in that end times questions group. Um, I'll give you a real short answer here tonight. The saddest part is that we're told that even though Jesus is going to be on planet Earth for a thousand years, and everyone who goes into that thousand years in their mortal unresurrected body, every single person who goes into that thousand years in their mortal unresurrected body is going to be a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ. But they're going to live to be hundreds of years old again. We're told that any, they're going to have children. They're going to marry and they're going to have children in that thousand years. And we're told that the children, anyone who lives less than 100 years old in that millennium is going to be considered an infant. But in some of the saddest verses of the Bible, God tells us that the children of these believers are going to turn against Jesus in unbelievable numbers, so much that they're like the sand on the seashore. Now think about what that means. That means that even though Jesus Christ himself is going to be personally here on this planet so that people can see him and talk to him and possibly even touch him, that after a thousand years of that, people will still turn against God. It's unbelievable. And it's like God says, what else can I do? I'm going to send you my son for a thousand years. And folks, for some people, that still won't be good enough. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to have the millennium. It's just one. But for you and I, we go into all eternity. We live with God forever and ever and ever in a place where there's no pain, no death, no mourning, and God himself will wipe away every tear. It's the most wonderful news I could ever share with you. All right, so where are we going next week in session six? Next week, we're going to focus on the fact that that seven-year period is three distinct periods. The first three and a half years, Jesus tells us that's the birth pains. We saw a little bit tonight that the first half of the 70th week is the great tribulation. That's the wrath of Satan. God's wrath, the day of the Lord, doesn't start till over here with the sixth seal. And next week, I'm going to give you a lot more details about what goes on this, uh, this week. 
and the seven, final 70th week, okay? Again, you can find me on Facebook. If you want to be my friend on Facebook, I'll get you into the end times question, or you don't have to, get in, you don't have to be a friend of mine to get in the end times questions group. Um, I answered a couple more questions on there today, and you're all welcome to go to that or, or join that group if you'd like. Boy, I'd really like to thank you for coming tonight. I know I gave you a lot to think about tonight, but the Lord is good. And again, let me just close with this tonight. Remember, the purpose of this seminar is not to convince you to believe what I believe. The purpose of this seminar is to get you thinking about the end times and to help prepare you for the future. And I hope that you feel when you walk away from here that you're much more prepared than maybe before you got here. And I would encourage you to share this seminar with anybody you think might be interested. That's the, the, there were many kind folks who donated so we could film this, so it could get on the internet and we could spread it to anyone who would be interested in watching it. So feel free to share those videos. Um, thanks for coming tonight. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.